hello, good evening everybody. Welcome to Enterprise Tuesday, our session on spotting the opportunity. Um, so this evening we're going to, it seems like rather a lot of people here tonight. We've got Jennifer Jeer on one end and Mo Elzek who have just completed our Enterprise Techstar programme. Both of them are currently PhD students. Um, they're going to be acting as chair. We have Vishal from Prowler, we have Louise Palmer Masterton from Stem and Glory, Professor Laura Zaki from um, Polyprox, and uh, John Cassidy, Cambridge Cancer Genomics. So we're going to hopefully learn a little bit about how they might have spotted the opportunities and the, the businesses that they've gone about to create. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, Mo. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks all the organizers. Uh, Claire and all the volunteers outside. Thank you guys for uh, coming tonight, for all who are watching us as well uh, online. Thank you. We have a very exciting uh, panel here waiting to hear from. And um, Enterprise Tuesday is a great opportunity to meet and uh, mix with uh, uh, people with great uh, deal of experience uh, to learn with. Um, so the, the, the theme of this tonight is spotting the opportunity. And we are going to talk about how to find the opportunity, what's a good opportunity, what's not a good opportunity, and to go through their journeys of how they, opportunities they found and opportunities they missed. Um, so I'm co-chairing this with Jen. Uh, I have to say that I, uh, Enterprise Tuesday was my first introduction to uh, Cambridge Entrepreneurial uh, Society or community, and I kept coming back. So. I worked with Jen uh, in the same building, but I met her uh, a year ago here. So it is a great uh, resource for, for Cambridge people. So uh, I'm going to uh, introduce a very diverse and fascinating panel with us tonight. Um, very, very, from the very far right. Uh, I'll start with uh, Vishal. Hello, Vishal. Hi. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. So I'm Vishal Chatra, the co-founder and the CEO at Prowler.io. Uh, at Prowler, we call ourselves the a decision company, and Prowler's AI optimizes, uh, which is probably the most important function inside any organization, which is making decisions. Uh, any organization, any company is a decision-making factory. So there are small decisions, big decisions, decisions that have their mark on the day that we are working, and also decisions that will change our tomorrow. Uh, so on the spectrum of uh, spot and opportunity and we decided well everybody makes decisions and typical decisions in any organization are very complex um, and anything essentially every uh, decision is not black and white it's a trade-off against lots on uh, lots of parameters you know out there so if you are in supply chain management you're making decisions against fuel cost uh, the time of delivery uh, the freshness of the food uh, like the cost of the ingredients and so on and so forth if you're in the financial markets and you're trading, you're making decisions against uh, 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 volatility, the drawdowns, uh, the risk that your investors want to take, and so on and so forth. So against all this, uh, our thesis when we started the company was that the actual uh, framework uh, that the humans use intuitively to make decisions doesn't really change. Mm. Uh, so hence, in order to prove that, we decided to start a company. And uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, now we are live in both in the financial markets. Our platform is used by some of the biggest hedge fund investors in the world to trade a portfolio of features. And simultaneously, it's also used by some of the largest uh, logistics and supply chain companies in the world to optimize their supply chains. Thank you. Over to you, Louise. Um, <clears throat> Louise Palmer Masterton, our founder and CEO, actually, of STEM and Glory a little bit um, anomaly amongst these, these guys. Um, not academic in any sense of the word, or blue chip. Um, so we're a multi-site vegan restaurant chain um, with quite big ambitions to ride the current Zeitgeist and um, go national, if not global. Um, I have previously run a multi-site leisure business, which is a business I exited early this year. Um, where do I sit on the opportunity spectrum? It's very interesting to me that I'm even here tonight and that you're actually studying things like this because, um, for me, it's never been a question of analysing or appraising a market to find some kind of niche that I can then set up a business around. Not at all like that. Coming almost entirely from a place of passion, both of my businesses. 
Um, there is, however, definitely an element of problem solution about it. That wasn't in any overt sense, but looking back, yes, definitely. My first business was a, a yoga business. Um, that came from doing yoga and teaching yoga in dusty village halls and piled up chairs around the corners, which drove me nuts to the point where I thought, I have to open a yoga studio. Um, second business, I was trying to find a decent vegan restaurant for about 35 years and managed to find one, so it was born out of that. So, yeah, don't know if that's helpful to any of you, but I would always advise to go for passion. I'm not sure if it's like that in business these days, but there's got to be some element that gets you up in the morning and fires you up with enthusiasm every day. That's quite a, a bit of a lot of opportunities in different businesses that we would love to learn more about them tonight. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, um, Professor Laura, would you like to share with us uh, your experience? Thanks, yeah. Um, so uh, I've been running an academic research group um, for 20 odd years. And um, in 2015, I had an idea for a new type of drug based on work that we were doing in the lab um, and uh, talked to Cambridge Enterprise about it uh, and they were very interested. It was a very topical area at the time and um, tried and failed to get funding for it, which is a sort of fairly common story. Managed to get some funding the next year and get some proof of concept data and we, put, uh, we, we filed a patent application. And from there, we um, looked to get some investment into a company and succeeded in doing that last year. And the company, we got the money into the company um, this spring. We're based at the Babraham Research Campus, and it's been a really exciting experience. Loads of amazing people, Cambridge Enterprise, um, opened lots of doors to, they're amazing as well, um, opened lots of doors to lots of other amazing people, so we have a great team in the company, and I now have two academic lab, uh, sorry, two labs, an academic one and a, a commercial one, and it's just really exciting opportunity to, to do more science, and hopefully, ultimately, to make a difference. Uh, it must be very hectic to run two labs or in two groups at the same time, but... Uh, yeah, uh, well, some of my lab are here, so they can probably... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to balance the <laughs> So, um, for John, do you want to give a Sure, call? yeah. Hi, so I'm, I'm John. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Cambridge Cancer Genomics. Uh, based in Cambridge, we do cancer genomics. So really, I guess what we care about is trying to understand how to get each patient the right drug at the right time to beat their cancer. So tumors are really complex. Anybody who's a cancer biologist here knows that. Not all drugs are going to work for all tumors. And also, tumors are going to change over time. So not all drugs are going to work to the same degree at the same time in each patient. So what we are all about really is trying to develop ways of understanding how a tumor is changing and what makes a tumor unique so that we can effectively target that tumor. And we do that through discovering and validating complex biomarkers, or what we call complex biomarkers. And uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you, John, for sharing this. So you all have had very diverse careers. So Michelle, you've worked for uh, Nokia and then in the automotive uh, industry. Um, uh, you ha Louise, you have worked in yoga, which you have just exited, and then going into restaurant business, and then um, being in academia uh, and a PhD student. So how and at what point of your career did you realize this is an opportunity that I'm going to take and pursue instead of letting it pass by? I guess the first time when I started my first company, it was, uh, again, very passionate about the automotive uh, sector. So I worked in Nokia for the longest time, and I was always trying to find an angle to work with car companies because having read too many Top Gear magazines, I was always keen to always go and try all the cars. It was a free opportunity to do so and to sneak into all the trade shows. So uh, uh, at that time, I was working on a solution, and then that was the time when Nokia started to go a bit uh, downhill. Uh, f for the older ones here, uh, Nokia was a company that used to make mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't anymore. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the work that I was doing, we were trying to get funding from the Nokia's management to start a new business. And of course, there was no money, but then I believed very strongly in the idea. And I thought, uh, you know, that's how the world should work based on first principles. Uh, 
had a discussion with my wife. She said, you have up to six months to raise funding. If you don't, how uh, sort of absolutely sure you are that somebody else will give you a job if you quit no care? I said, well, I'm absolutely sure I'll, you know, somebody will give me a job. I think, you know, <laughs> luckily somebody funded us and they started the, started the company. But really, the idea was it just comes from a sheer frustration sometimes of something not working. And uh, for good or for bad, uh, you are uh, 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 blissfully ignorant of the challenges. And that really kickstarts your career in entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> Please, okay. Like um, so, I, I think I understand your question. At what point do you decide to take the opportunity? Um, so, for me, I had other businesses actually even before the yoga. So, these are not my first two businesses. That I've worked in a completely different parallel universe of digital media before as well. Um, but the the theme with each of them, which is common, is that when I started to do the thing, which eventually became my business, it started to roll really well. And so all the kind of signs were there that it was well supported, it resonated with other people, uh, and that kind of carried it along. So it was almost a no-brainer, really, that it was kind of obvious to take that path. That's it, really. And like you say, you're oblivious to the challenges at that point. <laughs> so you just think, yeah, let's just go. <laughs> um, I would say that I, I didn't set out to start a company, but I had an idea and... Um, uh, despite you know people being discouraging in some instances, there were enough people who were interested in it that I thought it would be worth trying. And um, I knew the field quite well, so I was combining um, three different areas of expertise that I didn't think anyone else had. So, so I could see that there was a gap in this particular field. This is um, a way to um, inhibit um, proteins that are involved in disease. Um, by destroying them, using the cells machinery to destroy them. And, and this is a really sort of um, uh, blossoming area, but people were doing it one particular way, and, and I thought of another way of doing it. And I looked at the literature and I was surprised that other people actually weren't doing this and, and had a feeling that it was because they hadn't, they hadn't had experience in these three different fields that I had. So I thought there was a gap, um, and... Uh, other people thought it was exciting. It did have quite a lot of discouragement, but I think you just have to give things a try. And um, I thought, if I don't do it, somebody else will do it. And um, and that just seemed totally crazy. And then, you know, once you start on that journey, you, you have one pe person who seems really excited by it, and often you have one investor who's really excited by it, and then all the other investors seem to sort of come on board. So it's a bit like a, you know, bees around the honey pot. Um, yeah. And it sort of steamrolls into suddenly people are throwing money at you and, and mm -hmm. saying very nice this things. Is the and, yeah, <laughs> and also it's totally different from academia, which is, yeah. you know, it's just constant um, failure. You know, you, you don't get grants, you don't get papers published, and even when you do get grants, nobody praises you for it. You know, yes. it's just just like that's what you have to do. Whereas I, I found it's 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 very different in. Um, in the business world and, and that's quite exciting and, and really enjoyable and and people are amazing very very clever scientists uh business people just met a whole load of new people and learned a whole load of new things so cool. um so i think i've been asked this question like 20 times and i think i've probably given about 20 different answers to why we started ccg but i think if you really unpack the question it's really about when do you know it's time to go, like when do you know it's time to seize this opportunity? Because as a kind of entrepreneurial type person, you probably walk around life, and you guys all probably walk around life, seeing frustrating things every day, and seeing like, I don't know, this process is not optimized, or this industry needs changing, or this is wrong, or this product needs to be built, or whatever. So how do you know which one do you have to kind of jump into and, and go for and give it your all? And I think that comes down to two things, really. One is context, so like where you are. Is it a good time to jump into something? Is a, do you have the people around you to support you? Do you have, you know, are you thinking about leaving Nokia because it's stopping making three, uh, 33 tens or, or whatever? And opportunity cost. So there's only a, there's like a small window of time in your life where you can give 100% to something. And really I think you, 
when you decide to do that, to give 100% to something, you kind of have to believe that that's going to be a transformative thing. So that's going to be a big thing that's worth spending your, your time doing. It's something that you can see yourself working on in five years and getting up in the morning in five years. Mm. So I think for me it was a combination of context, which was met a great postdoc in my lab, got sick of my PhD, and opportunity cost, which I'm sure some people can relate to. And um, uh, opportunity cost where I thought, you know, cancer is a good problem. This is a real problem needs solved. Mm. Let's dive in, let's give it 100%. Yeah, I wanna I wanna actually extend a bit. Um, talk about this point uh, specifically whether it is always should be a big problem that you try to solve um, or not. I mean, uh, uh, big problems are quite challenging uh, and sometimes need more more resources. Are a bit daunting for some of the you know early entrepreneurs mm -hmm. um, uh, versus like small problems where you can provide a solution to the community quite quickly and get reward for it. So uh, I don't know. I mean, cancer is a big problem. Um, do you think it always has to be a big problem that can uh, motivate the people and find opportunities to? Um, so my opinion, which may be wrong, is that you kind of have to decide, I guess, whether you want to pursue a lifestyle-ish business. That could be good, could be big, could, could be great, could be you know mm. bringing way more money than my company will ever bring in. But you know, I've always wanted to run a whiskey distillery, so like, it could be that. But, um, uh, or is it a... Could do both. Actually. Yeah, could do, well, that's the dream. Or is it a bona fide startup? And mm. I think to decide whether it's a bona fide, you know, SpaceX style startup, yeah. what I like to do is think about um, what is the... So how do I imagine the world in like 50 years? Well, obviously, Computers are going to be, or decision-making processes are going to be automated by by uh, computers or machine learning in some way. Obviously, people are going to be eating in more sustainable food, and they're going to be, you know, more caring about the environment and not eat as much beef. And obviously, and sorry for like, you know, reducing your companies to like <laughs> my understanding of them. And obviously, we're going to have better drugs for for all manner of diseases. So, if that is obviously the case in the future, but it's not happening right now, mm. then somebody's going to do it. So somebody's going to make that jump and, and do that thing that's mm. going to deliver this future that we all agree is mm. going, to, going to come. Um, and I think that if you, in my opinion, if it's a bona fide startup, high growth thing, then it does have to be a problem that need that will be solved in 50 years or should be mm. should be solved in the society that we imagine in 50 years. Yeah. Um, a new pair of trainers probably not a huge problem unless they're like jetpack trainers or something. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, and I think it's a good point. I think just to add to that, I think this whole notion of big or small opportunity probably I'll say that the uh, sort of value of that opportunity to I mean to the world is probably how uh, you know I would look at it. So to me, you know, somebody will try to run a you know vegan restaurant and essentially transform the way the world eats their food and essentially also be able to sort of. Uh, educate is, is like a massive thing because essentially what you're really doing is trying to create a lever that changes the way how the world operate in no matter which way you might do it. Uh, certain people have practical skills to do it, like you know, opening a restaurant. Some people like me have no practical skills <laughs> to do it. And hence, uh, we end up in the world of you know, creating software systems. We can drive, when, when we can just dream about them people can code them. That's the beauty of uh, software, that you're not sort of limited by mm. uh, the laws of physics or the law of biology or anything anything that you can imagine you can code. Mm. Uh, but essentially the goal is uh, always, you know, part of that dream is there that you can fundamentally change how the world operates. In our case, we focus really on optimizing things to kind of reduce waste and everything. So it's really from that perspective, but that core belief is there that you're able to fundamentally change something. Otherwise, if you don't have that big desire, it's, it's hard to wake up every morning and mm. go through all the painful process of raising capital. <laughs> Rest everything is fun. <laughs> <laughs> raising capital is not. <laughs> so, yeah. Michelle, you mentioned that you, know, you have to really look at gaps in the market and how you can tackle it. But what if you identify gaps that you know that are 
are going to be met, but you don't have the technical background, do you think that it is worth pursuing ideas, um, venturing into something you don't know? So, Louise, you've done yoga, that is probably very different from, uh, you know, starting a restaurant chain. So can you comment on how you looked at the market, but decided that even though this is different, I'm still going to pursue it or I'm not going to pursue it. Do you want me to take that? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think just from a perspective and I think especially I would really like to emphasize the point of uh, some people not having, not being limited by a particular skill that's needed to uh, sort of exercise the opportunity. So there are two different things. You recognize the opportunity and the second thing is to execute on the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had not even heard about AI and machine learning till six years ago when I came to Cambridge. I probably couldn't even spell it. So it was just pure luck of landing up here and being introduced through Cambridge Enterprise of some entrepreneurs who were starting this company called Vocal IQ. And you start to understand from, from first principles what it could do. Uh, and after Vocal IQ got acquired by Apple and then you know there I was trying to figure out what to do next with my life. Uh, I learned about decision making, but I had no technical background at all in uh, even putting the frameworks together from machine learning to make decisions, where I was lucky enough to find my co-founder and build a team and find Professor Carl Rasmussen to put the whole idea together. Uh, but that's where the combination came of my blissful ignorance on the technical challenge, but having trusted people who understood the technical challenge and then being able to put the team together and they get invest investors to sort of trust us. Mm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I think it's good to mention luck does, yeah, does play luck a, has a, part. Part. Um, luck has a massive and, part. And and recognizing that. Yeah. The other thing is that in terms of okay, the various things I've done with my life, it was never clinical. There was one thing and then another. There's a lot of overlap yeah. in all of this. Um, and in terms of, I think entrepreneurship is a, is a disposition, um, and wherever you apply it. If you, if you apply it, you will succeed because you, you have an opportunity if you breathe um, passion and fire into it, then it will, it will take off. And I think flexibility is very important because often what you set out to do, you, you may go in a slightly different direction and that's really okay. So being able to recognize those paths when they change direction and, and still have the confidence to stay with it. And know and know when it's all going in the right direction, and and I mean you know you're all here already. This kind of human capacity for learning new things. I mean it's kind of what makes me tick. You know I don't see differences. It's all transferable yeah. stuff anyway, and you're just constantly evolving, evolving, mm -hmm. evolving, learning, meeting new people, learning from them, and, and, and things just take the course that they're going to. Mm. And it, if it, you can tell when it works, <laughs> it just you know the signs yes. that, that everything starts ringing and, and flying, and people come to you like you say, and you meet great people and. Together, you make great things happen. Uh, these are the signs to look out for. Yeah, the first time you get paid. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I would like to say, like, sometimes the opportunity finds you when you're like, uh, when you're like, you find the right team, as you alluded to, uh, Michelle, and uh, you, you are in the right moment, uh, as John mm -hmm. said. And then these all factors combined together, um, they, 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 there is a certain recipe for success uh, for, for any uh, startup. But uh, in academia, uh, Laura, how, how do you feel about that? Is, is it the same recipe or is it like, because many, many people um, in University of Cambridge have um, groups, they don't necessarily think into like taking their uh, research outside their labs and uh, do in the business world. But how do you think about the differences between these uh, funding opportunities and and, and academia versus business world? I think it, it's, to some extent it was easier for me because I didn't have to give up my day job, right? So it wasn't so much of a risk. Started the company, but um, still had my academic position. So I you know, still had a salary coming in, uh, whether or not the company you know, works out on, in the end. Um, I, think, uh, I think people are very keen to to really sort of commercialize their work um, and especially younger people and uh, some older people are quite resistant and feel that it's you in know, Cambridge. It, it probably yes just in Cambridge think it's a bit of a dirty word you know uh, and I did get encounter people who said oh well, you shouldn't be doing this or uh, how can you do this and run your group and but you know you, the people who say that are the people who've never tried or um, tried but failed or whatever so you, it, it, 
um, don't really take other people's advice. You just mm -hmm. go ahead. And the thing is, if you have an idea, I mean, it's crazy not to at least try to to take it somewhere because um, you know that it you just have to have, take a bit of a deep breath and try it out and. and um, because you have, I have my academic job. Um, I'm not taking so many risks, mm. really. On the other hand, you know, I'm, we're, I'm a director of my company, so um, I have a responsibility to the people working in the company that, that's kind of different from the responsibility that I have to my research group. So, um, so I'm not, I'm not being flippant in saying that I, I don't have to worry so much and there's less of a risk. But um, I think I, I didn't set out to have to do this it just i had an idea and i knew it would it, it was competitive and it filled a gap in the market i wanted to do something that that could be very generally applied not applied to one niche area of medicine and um, i think because i'm quite an ambitious person so i just thought that doing something really big would be really exciting so it, it, i mean we we would imagine it in, in science that it's always like a eureka, eureka moment when you're saying like this is a good business idea let's take it forward was it like this for you or um, is it like yeah i think uh, i mean probably not a eureka moment but i think uh the, the people there was a, a particular person from cambridge enterprise who worked in that field and uh and so we both just talked it through, and, and I think then I realised that mm. you know she thought there was definitely something in it, and and yeah. So you had the intention or the yeah yeah. yeah. Well, um, not but no no not really a really moment. <laughs> I can't say. <laughs> there there are very few you can moments. Sometimes it's just a funny moment when you find a, a good opportunity. But um, for you, John, like big big problems also attract uh, many people. Mm. So how do you think about finding spotting opportunity when there is also a bit of competition out there? Uh, that's fine. Gonna go, gonna go for blue oceans, as I'm sure you MBA or your enterprise tech people will learn. But um, yeah, competition can be healthy. Um, but I, I would say that, uh, just to touch on the last point, is that there's a bit of d a debate that I'm kind of seeing now. And I don't know, has anybody read uh, Zero to One by Peter Thiel? A couple of people. So it's a great book, and maybe some mistakes, but you know, a great guy and whatever. And um, there's there's a big push in this book and from other people that we should stop generalizing. Like, so our education process is all about learning a bunch of different skills and learning a bunch of different skills and a bunch of different skills without specializing enough. And then, and so you should you know choose what you want to do and go really really deep on that. And on the other side of the field, you kind of see people like Steve Jobs and, and what you just mentioned, where you need kind of an overlap between two different fields to spot an opportunity. So you needed to have a chat with somebody from Cambridge Enterprise, but you know, you may, if for the Jobs example, you know, maybe if you were involved in the counterculture revolution and computer science revolution, then you start to see these opportunities in the, in the overlap, in the kind of gray area. And I think that's, that's important to, to remember. Um, so sometimes you start with like spotting the, the, the team, the opportunity for a good team or a good combination. I just think that it's important, if you, the easiest way to try and spot opportunities is to have knowledge of two different fields and look for the intersect mm -hmm. and look for, and that's the, that's the bit where you see things that nobody else has seen. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously because you're more of a generalist than a you know, deep person, then maybe you need to hire into your weaknesses. Which goes back to the previous point of you know what happens if, what happens if you don't know anything about machine learning? Well, you just hire a machine no. learning person. Mm -hmm. You, you co-found with a machine learning person. Mm -hmm. um, but being being the person to find the ideas, I think it's important to remember that generalism is, is quite good in my opinion. Oh, I think it's a very good point. So I, my first job was in manufacturing and operations, yeah. and then I went about and did you know a bunch of other stuff for the next twenty years, and then for for the next fifteen years, and then then I started to look into this and I looked back and I said, well, that world's not changed at all. Yeah. You know, you still have, you know, kind of systems like, you know, SAP doing enterprise resource planning and everything's like, Pfft. and then I had a chat with sort of Donko, my co-founder was this very bright guy and said, Donko, could you do this? Yeah, yeah, of course, you know, like this, yes, of course. And then yeah. you, you just start to, so, so, so kind of essentially, 
in a way, I'm not doing anything new. I'm really trying to solve the problems that I was yeah. quite fed up with 20 years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but now I have really good people to solve the problems. Yeah. Yeah. So in yeah. terms of, you know, you, you guys both talk about range and looking at overlaps. Um, can you define for the audience who might be, you know, like trying to go for an opportunity, is there an anatomy of a good opportunity versus an opportunity that is not worth going for? Are there specific things like gap in the market, how much you relate to the idea, value? So I think uh, a single probably formula doesn't work because I think all our experience shows that we come from very, you know, very different directions. I have my own definition, right? So my view is that if you go and raise your first, try to raise your seed round, and if 95% of the investors don't think you're nuts, means that you're not really doing something sort of, you know, kind of really innovative. Right, and if it if what you're trying to do has already shown up in the Economist or FT, don't bother. Right, so kind of that's my criteria because I guess part of it me the part of the stuff that actually drives me to do something is my own sort of desire to learn new things. So I'm a person who gets bored very easily. So the greater the sort of unknown in front of me the more interested I am. So the thing that really gets me to work every morning is my lack of understanding of how to make these things better. Of course, we are sort of moving on. We started to have some uh, commercial success and all that, but they still drive because the complexity of the world in which we're trying to apply is so huge. Uh, and I think the day, and of course, one of the kind of benefits of growing a company is uh, as we are sort of growing sort of along, my own job is changing, right? So now we're 116 people. What I do today was completely different from a month ago or a month before that. And so I'm learning more about myself, about the market, but the key thing is, no, I, at least I can't figure out one common thread in the opportunities I have seen in my working career, mm. unfortunately. There's so, actually a Paul, sorry. There, yeah, sure. There's actually a Paul Graham essay um, on the start of what you said there. Um, so Paul Graham founded Y Combinator, which is a big accelerator in, in the state. And, um, so Y Combinator take in like 100 companies per batch now, and they try and maintain a ratio where about 20% of companies don't get funded. Yeah. Because they figure that if all companies get funded, they're not taking crazy enough ideas. Yeah. So you do, some people do need to think that you're crazy, I think, for you to yeah. have a great idea. But yeah, so carry on. Yeah, so, so crazy factor really nice. and excitement, but what, what makes you want to go for one opportunity versus another one? <laughs> I think what you just said about um, new horizons and excitement is really important. You've got to challenge yourself and, you know, if, uh, if you're this kind of disposition, it's, it's kind of essential, really, you wouldn't go forward without it. I, I think disruption is quite important. I don't think it's always a case of taking something completely new and different. I think approaching existing industries and disrupting them is kind of seen a lot now. I mean, it's very common in hospitality, for example, you, you see it everywhere the old ways are gone now, um, and the new ways are what we're, it's getting very exciting again, hospitality, because of that. And it's often it's people who are not from hospitality backgrounds that are coming in and disrupting it. So I guess don't be afraid of sidestepping into a slightly different industry. Um, yeah. And I think there has to be a first principles of, you know, in sort of approach to it. And I think it's just various ways of identifying uh, like a gap in the market. I think just I the think, whole opportunity yeah. to eat sort of sustainably is so obvious and people are mm -hmm. not doing it. I think you do. I think entrepreneurs kind of automatically do their market research constantly yeah. anyway. You're constantly appraising the market. You're looking for signs. Um, you're seeing what other people are doing. I mean, my days are pretty much filled with that kind of activity anyway. And I think you just find your way, don't you, to, to the yeah. right path and the right opportunity. But you know, I was thinking when you were saying that about ideas, about we all have ideas all the time, and you've probably had five million since we've been sat in this room. You know, we have ideas constantly, 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 and then, then but they, they sort of filter themselves, and then they sort of rise to the top, and then you speak to other people about them, like you say, and you kind of start to get some resonance with other people, and then it starts to become more and more clear. I'm not, I'm not sure there is a, a decision moment in it. It's a process, I suppose. And talk about aha moments. I mean, I have multiple aha moments all the time. And there's often there are moments where I'll be thinking about my business or thinking about something, and I'll see something that tells me that that is possible. That I know, I suddenly in that moment know that it's going to be possible. And mm. kind of little mini aha moments, I suppose. <laughs> Don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you have a, a big restaurant in Cambridge. 
Yes. And there was no vegan? There was no, no. Oh. I mean, I, I literally really? was trying to get a decent <laughs> vegan meal for 35 years. And there was all one. There's lots of vegan places around now, but yeah, yeah mm. not, not doing what I wanted to eat, basically. Uh, no, and, I, and, and I think there's two ways to look at that, right? So I think this is probably optimistic and a sort of pessimistic view or the sort of a classical definition where somebody might come and say, there are no vegan restaurants in Cambridge. So that means there's no market for it. Mm. Yeah. And where somebody like Lewis says, well, there are no vegan restaurants in Cambridge, fantastic. Let's <laughs> open one. That was a big aha moment. <laughs> no, but it wasn't actually like that at all. It came from a place of passion. I'm a vegan person myself. Yeah. I had another business. This is what I talk about overlap. So my food business grew out of my other business. They were together as the same business. And when we, we, I took the gamble on opening the first named i've been i've been playing around with food in in the, in the studio context for quite a few years anyway but when we actually went for it and put it out there it just took off just like that so it wasn't even a decision oh, of that there wasn't one in cambridge it was just right we're going to go for it went for it and then it just took off really really fast mm. um which then gave the confidence to take it to the next stage yeah i don't know when people look at entrepreneurs they kind of perceive this sort of risk factor i'm not really sure from inside that's how it is you know, I never proceed with something until I'm pretty sure about it. Um, but all of that stuff's kind of been internalised. Yeah. Um, I've been constantly going through it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, th I think it's an important point, and I think also to differentiate between risk and uh, 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 gambling. So I don't gamble at all. I, gambling never excites me. I've never played poker. or I, I've been to Las Vegas many times because of a business uh, of the kind of electronics trade shows. But I've never gambled. I just find it the most boring thing on the planet. But the risk is completely different. You know, kind of risk is really sort of analyzing and uh, taking a calculated, educated risk. That's a completely different game. And I think that's what I find interesting. Yeah. So like entrepreneurs are usually like framed also as like problem solvers. So sometimes yes. these problems would, would be personal, uh, as in your case. Um, but uh, for Laura, like, do, do you think it's it's uh, you know? For you in academia, do you think it's easy for you to find like uh, to, to 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 work in ideas that you're interested in, like or you you uh, like triage what you want to work on? Um. Uh, I think Cambridge is you know the environment. There's so many people here. There's so, everyone has lots of contacts, so it is it is easier. Um, and Cambridge Enterprise certainly held my hand the whole way through, so I didn't have to go and do things that other people might have to do themselves. Um, yeah, so there are lots of opportunities. Um, and uh, the, you know, the people in the company were all um, in, colleagues of people in Cambridge Enterprise. So lots of doors were opened via Cambridge Enterprise. And those people, uh, for example, our executive chair, I mean, he, he just seemed to know everyone in Cambridge. So. We got um, space at the Bay Abraham Research Campus, which is, you know, it's very prestigious and has a lot of waiting lists. But you mm. know, doors can be opened for you if you know the right people. So I think all these things are, you know, easier in certain environments. And Cambridge is not at all unique. I'm not saying that it's, you know, a particularly special place. In fact, actually, you know, people do say it in academia, Cambridge is sort of behind other places because people don't interact with each other so much. But I'm a very interactive person, so I mean, I think it. It's a good place, and it's easy if you have an idea to to um, get there. You just have to be quite pushy about um, pushing your way to the front of Cambridge Enterprises um, tech transfer people and getting their attention. So, uh, yes, if I might, if I might just give an outsider's view to Cambridge, because I only moved here six years ago, right? So, having lived in different parts of the world, what I really found fantastic about Cambridge was the openness. Right? I could literally just walk up to any person, any professor, just a lack of ego. You know, they'll just talk to you. And uh, it was so, uh, I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. And, and I've also lived in California, where I can tell you it's not like that. Uh, and I think the, and I think that's where people who have lived in Cambridge for a very long time, they probably don't appreciate what a special place mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. And. Also, when you look at some of the uh, industry research that's been done, there's an article in The Economist about 12, 24 months ago, which compared Cambridge to Oxford. And there was about nine times higher rate of uh, turning research into, um, into uh, sort of commercial companies and so on and so forth. And I think Cambridge has built 
uh, what I would almost describe as a permanent uh, sort of a positive effect. And I don't think any place will catch up. Definitely not Oxford. It's just like <laughs> no. Let me let me explain. And you Oxford will come in this conversation. I, I think the startup ecosystem is a platform game, right? So if you look at Google, right? So Cambridge is like the Google startup ecosystem. Oxford is like Bing. Right. <laughs> so it's never going to catch up, right? So I think that's why we believe there's a. Uh, I think just, I mean, there's lots of um, inspiring people here, and it really helps. So yeah. you know, for everyone who said, "Oh, you know, it's, you're never going to be able to do that," there was always you, you just looked at people down the road in uh, you know big people who've started up multiple companies, and you know that you can be, you can do it really mm. successfully, and, and they're very inspiring. So I think having lots of those people around really helps as well. So I, I would agree in general, I do love Cambridge. But, but, we're the third most productive in terms of papers bioscience cluster in the world. So where's our Genentech? Where's Amgen? Where's PMS? Where's I Celgene? Think it's, yeah, I mean, we're, so one thing that is kind of frustrating is, um, you know, everyone says, and, and it's true that, uh, so we, we got 3.4 million in seed funding, which isn't very much for, if you're trying to do drug discovery. And you know that in the States that would yeah. be, you know, they put 30 million in without a, a blink of the eye. And, and we were told also, you know, actually you don't need, really need to get any proof of concept data. It's mm. so exciting, people will put money in, but probably not in the UK, in, in the States mm. it's just so much more money. It's probably not always, it's probably sometimes counterproductive, mm. right, that you can put too much money in at the beginning, but. I'm sure it's a, it's a different mindset that's more yeah. ambitious. Um, yeah. Somebody did tell me once more, it was... More willing to take big risks yeah. on, on, mm. on an idea. Somebody did tell me once, I don't have any evidence for this, that um, Cambridge is very good at like, creating the stuff and then doing the first stages and then we really struggle with the next part. Yeah. Yeah. So then we sell to American companies yeah. and then yeah, we move back. And like, of course, we have a history of that, right? Mm. With that antibodies. Yeah. You know, we just lost all that. Yeah. Um, World's best selling drug. Uh, like, oh. And that's because, um, you know, the, the tech transfer people aren't always great at seizing those ideas yeah. and actually really pushing them. And you do have to be very pushy to get things mm. moving. I, I guess yeah. one of the reasons for that, and I think uh, uh, you made a very good point about, uh, so actually John made a very good point about uh, the past history shows that the companies don't grow beyond a certain scale, and that's mm -hmm. really been due to the lack of uh, 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 growth capital here. Mm. And that sort of started to change in the last three, four years. You have, at least in the last two, three years, some funds have come that provide the uh, growth yeah. capital, and that simply wasn't there. And I think that's why also we sold Vocal IQ to Apple when we did. Yeah. Uh, there was no growth capital. And uh, the one that was sort of uh, available, the terms were so crap that you know you just took yeah, the back yeah. of the you know, calculation and just just sell it, right? Uh, but then you sort of, like, like in a way, I don't see it really bad. You know, you can just keep kind of spinning lots of companies so because in business, it's all about sort of a turnover, right, yeah. of your basically capital. So think of a way if at least, you know, somebody doesn't, you know, give you growth capital, sell the company to the, you know, to the next mm -hmm. one. Just keep the turnover, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the at the end of the day, as an entrepreneur, what you should be really thinking about, what's the fastest way to value for the world? It could be as an independent company or part of a bigger one. Sure. I, and I think both are very respectable yeah. ways for an outcome. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'd be thrilled. No, no. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know how it is. Sell my company to a company. Yeah. 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 Um, so do, you think, do you think there's enough seed capital? Or, sorry? Do you think there's enough seed capital or venture capital? I think seed is probably just easier to so having sort of gone through a cycle. Seed was kind of easier. Mm -hmm. uh, series A was harder. I think for Series B was the one, it was really hard for us. I mm -hmm. think because I think especially the scale at which you we were growing. And I think we were slightly unique sort of a proposition as a company that a typical Series B company will have, you know, five, ten billion in revenues yeah. and blah, blah, blah. We didn't have anything of that because we were so much focused on creating the basic science uh, behind decision making, which didn't exist. Yeah. So we ended up, you know, publishing 57 peer reviewed papers, being globally number six at kind of New Europe's conference mm -hmm. and, uh, f you know, filing all these patents. But then, how do you explain to the investors? And like a lot of investors used to kind of tell us, we're just like a glorified uh, you know, arm of Cambridge yeah. University just mm. kind of publishing papers. But we said, well, 
we have to prove the maths somehow, right? Uh, and to prove the maths, the best way is to go and publish in the top journals, have the top academics, uh, you know, go and look at it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, fortunately, we managed to sort of get through the so-called valley of death, mm. uh, raise the capital, and now we've been able to, you know, uh, get get commercial. But uh, but it was tough. Yeah, it was very this tough. is what I'm struggling with today. <laughs> So in terms of the Cambridge ecosystem, you all agree that you know there's a lot of opportunities for you know seed fund and then growing, yeah. but not so much at you know the uh, massive growth stage yeah, grow. to make big companies. So going back to opportunities, have you guys encountered opportunities that you've pursued but didn't really go anywhere? And at what point do you say? This I need to stop. I'm not giving up. But I'm quitting this so that I need to pursue an opportunity that has growth potential. I, I think yeah, I think that's a very important question. And I think with every startup, you will go down you know all sorts of rabbit holes in the beginning. And the rabbit hole we went down uh, was that when we started the company three and a half years ago, uh, and there was this big uh, machine learning company that was talking about the fact that you can solve lots of board games and Atari games and then somehow it will transfer into kind of real world, you know, because what, more, you know, what a great idea, we'll do the same. And uh, for the first uh, nine, ten months, we worked very much into building a simulation platform that simulated games. And then two things occurred to us, you know, very soon. And we were also, of course, looking at the real world problems. And then we realized two things. Number one, when you're in a, in a, in a in a simulation of a game, your like the rules of the game are well defined, whereas in the real world there are no well defined rules of the game. It evolves all the time. And the second thing was that uh, uh, the observation of the environment is complete. You have full observability. So from a decision making perspective, uh, it was like what you describe as a Markov decision process. And when you have partial observability, it's a partially observable Markov decision process. Luckily, because of my co-founders and the bright guys from the machine learning side, uh, we realized that the mathematics of a fully observable or a partially observable is completely different. So anything that you do in simulation in a ga game world can never be applied to real world problem, period. There's no argument about it. It's like trying to make pizza with seaweed. It doesn't work. <laughs> Right? So we had to take that entire piece of work, 12 months, and throw it into the bin and start from scratch. Good thing was we went back to the investors. We said, put our arms up. This is complete nonsense what we have believed from the rest of the world. But our investors said, by the way, but do you, do you think like the rest of the world is crazy? We said, yes. Let's do it again. Luckily, they supported us, went out. Right? So it was a combination of us being honest with it and having the investors who trusted us. But yes. It was it was painful. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to comment on any opportunities that you didn't think yeah. were worth pursuing and then had to cut off at some point? I mean, there's opportunities all the time, and I mean, what you just described. I mean, sometimes you, you go with a, with a problem in a certain direction, and you're going about it all wrong, and you do have to go back to the beginning. Yeah. It's not necessarily that you have to abandon it completely. You're just not doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. um, but there are many many rabbit holes. Um, and you know, on a daily basis, we have them in the kind of work we do, and you just have to kind of. It's, I think the 80 20 rule is quite a good one to apply a lot of the time. You know, we spend 80% of our time on stuff which is like producing 20% of the revenue. Um, just constantly monitor that one because, you know, really those are the things that you should drop. Concentrate on the things which make the revenues more easily and kind of flow much better. Don't be afraid to try things differently, though. Mm -hmm. don't, you don't have to just give up when something doesn't work the first time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You have a. I, I don't. You try. My first. That was successful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> there is. I mean, there are opportunities, absolutely everywhere. Yeah. And I guess for me, it comes down to opportunity costs. Like, it, would your time be best spent doing this or doing something else? And also, sometimes you do go around down the wrong track, and you need to know when to kill, which is a difficult decision in its own. But also, you get lots of opportunities, of like, you know, internally and externally. And you know, I was in Japan a couple of weeks ago, and they have these ramen restaurants where, like, you pay for the food in a vending machine, and then you stand at a bar and you eat the ramen really fast, then you leave. And I think that would be great in Cambridge. But oh, yeah. do I want to work in a ramen restaurant <laughs> for five years? <laughs> Probably not. But it would be great, and it might make money. So it would yeah. be fun. But um, yeah, it's all about how best you can use your time, I guess. 
So it's like the faster you, you try things, the faster you know, uh, you assess the opportunity and see like if it's going to work on the long run. No. And, and or, or not. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think that's a massive business opportunity to take the payment up front when you go to it's a great, restaurant. It's isn't it? Because, because waiting for the right? bill is the most yeah. wrong thing on the planet yeah. because they come and they give you the check yeah. and then they vanish again. Should we do that? Expecting that you know, <laughs> something you don't want to pay. No, no, please take the money. On some business You're, you're witnessing history here. <laughs> I just kind of thought we were just talking actually because I mean this is a little bit off topic but it can maybe illustrate the point. So we use Facebook ads a lot. Does anyone do Facebook ads? Facebook yeah. ads is gold, by the way, for marketing. Um, and, and sometimes there's no rhyme or reason for it, but you'll just get an ad which just performs really brilliantly, and you don't really think it was much different from that one which didn't perform so brilliantly. So, so the, the trick is just to leave that then and let that one tick over and just keep keep generating all those hits because mm -hmm. the tendency is always just to keep changing, keep changing, keep changing. But when you get something that works, just just let it roll and keep rolling mm -hmm. and then monitor its success yeah. so I guess measure everything yeah measure everything and I mean it's like this A-B testing it's a bit testing yeah. I mean it's kind of everybody talks yeah. about it a lot but in really simple terms it's literally just that when you do something small and it works just let that one keep working mm -hmm. don't don't keep changing but, and you know everything from marketing to trialing new things sometimes there is no reason why something mm -hmm. succeeds but it does so just let it carry on succeeding all on its own and don't tinker yeah. with it anymore yeah, there, there are two spectrums of the problem. Some people like are not flexible enough to change, and some people are changing chronically. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, for you, Laura, um, for so many people here in this room, students, would you would you say would what kind of advice would you give to them, like if they want to pursue like entrepreneur career um, during their PhD or studies? Or yeah, I mean, there's so many more opportunities now, and I mean, I didn't have a clue. I mean, of course, people were doing this. Um, you know, 30 years ago, but um, so you know, I'm quite late, a uh, late starter, right? But um, I think there are more opportunities now. It's much more acknowledged. Uh, there are courses, lots of courses, like courses at the judge. Uh, I think it's really, it's really great, and people should um, have the opportunity to try new things. Mm. So you would recommend that yeah, people do do their PhDs really or do yes, yeah. <laughs> as long as they you know finish their PhDs first, <laughs> <laughs> ideally. <laughs> oh, but, but yes, um, that doesn't always happen. It doesn't always work out. Well, that I way. think there's some there's some quite famous people who abandon yes, their PhDs yeah. to take a business career. Actually, yeah. in fact, I must put my own hand up. <laughs> I um, didn't go to Cambridge University to pursue a career in business. I actually didn't take up my place at Cambridge. Because my business was taking off at the time. Um, I took a two-week holiday and took my thesis, <laughs> which sucked. Um, I think it's just to touch on that point. I think and your point is, it's really easy to like not appreciate the opportunities that you have. So even when I was doing my PhD like three or four years ago, I tried so hard to get onto the management of technology and innovation course as a judge. And they just wouldn't fund it for my department. And I like I went all the way up through the department. I went like all the way up through the judge business school, and they just wouldn't let me take part in this course, even though we're part of the same university. And now you guys get to do like enterprise tech, and you get to do a bunch of like cool stuff. And it's really easy to, to you know, not appreciate that, I think. But you got you got to get you got to get like a world class STEM education, and then at the same time free business lectures. Like, have you read the brochure out there of how much business lectures cost? They're like 10 grand or something for a week. Like, it's really valuable stuff that, you're, that, that you get access to now. Definitely. So going off of what you were saying, um, I think Cambridge is really good in that multiple departments, not just a judge business school, is having you know, innovation and um, commercialization programs like iTeams from uh, yeah. West Cambridge and then Judge Business School and then Adam Brooks uh, Graduate Forum. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open the floor for questions um, for the panelists. We have a question, please raise your hand. Take the microphone. Hi, just um, listen to you guys and uh, obviously some of you guys have taken seed funding or Series A. Um, how much do you think the, the investors have contributed to the business and how important it is that they, they're in a similar industry as yourselves? So I think at least, maybe if I can answer first, I think there was no way a company like us could basically survive at all if we didn't have the investors that we had. So we're like supremely lucky at the seed round to get 
uh, Herman Hauser and you know Amadeus Capital uh, as our investors, and of course uh, Passion Capital, because there are very few people on the planet who have, or, or at least very few investors who have a PhD in physics who can understand what the hell is a Gaussian process, right? And uh, and I think there was this fundamental belief uh, in basically mathematics uh, being right. You can build a business because my principle that I have, if, if your maths is right, you can build a business out of it, right? But if your maths is wrong, you know, even God cannot help you. So, 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 I, think, so I think that's sort of a fundamental bit. So we were very lucky of that belief because we were so early stage. Uh, I remember the investors asking us, uh, you know, at our seed round, uh, do you have a demo? Answer was no. Uh, do you have anything to show? Answer was no. What was the earliest you can show a demo? Probably 12 months after we've hired 25 people, right? So that intrinsic belief, and I think investors are so important, and I think for us, each of the rounds right in front of the business uh, introductions, they've been f uh, foundational. So most important decision. <laughs> so, so just how did I value was, sorry, how, how do they value a company at the initial stage if you had no demo and no, I guess, no, no, no business? I guess it depends upon the entrepreneurs because uh, statistics show that the world's most successful entrepreneurs are in their 40s. And I think somebody came, the, the best age to be an entrepreneur was 45, kind of statistically speaking. I was obviously a bit younger than that, maybe 44 at that time, or 43, but anyway. So, so I think I had the, of course, I had the benefit here that because of Vocal IQ, which was also invested into by KMG Enterprise and Herman Hauser, we were able to make an 18x exit in 14 months uh, for Amadeus Capital. So of course, uh, by the time I went there, so you know Herman and the Amadeus team you know, realized that I wasn't completely mad. So you know they uh, sort of allowed us to give a certain valuation, and of course. How you value is really you sort of start to think about that you have to raise so much basically capital and by the time your company gets to a certain extent you should have a reasonable stake and you shouldn't be completely diluted out otherwise you won't be motivated and luckily you have uh, investors. So to be honest, I really didn't ask for uh, the valuation of the company. I went to Herman and I said this is what we want to do. Uh, Herman after hearing the pitch said that great Vishal, uh, I will offer you so much money for so much stake in the company. I didn't even negotiate. I said, whatever. Yes. <laughs> you, you, Herman, if you think it is right, <laughs> it is OK. Because my sole objective was to get Herman as an investor. That's the only thing I wanted. Well, we, also <laughs> had a, we also had a similar, um, not a similar experience, yeah. but uh, um, a really exciting experience with Herman. Um, because he was uh, in the one of the investment committees. I think it was Cambridge Enterprise or CIC. Um, and he was dialing in, and uh, this was for Cambridge Enterprise to put money in. But he, on the end of the phone, in this room full of people, said, "You know, we really like the, um, uh, we really like what you're doing. We want to put half a million in." And um, he didn't in the end. But um, and then the next day, he wanted to come and talk about the science. So the next day, he came down to the lab. Um, you know, I didn't have to go and see him. Came to the lab, talk, explained the biology. You know, he's not a biologist, but immediately asked spot on questions. And I think when you have investors like that, it is really amazing. I mean, it's like a really amazing journey. They're really enthusiastic, and um, we don't have him. <laughs> but uh, I think he started that. I partly started that process off and gave me belief that you know it was a really good idea, and, and it was something that could grow much bigger. Um, and then, uh, you know, other investors come on board once you have one interested. Mm -hmm. I think one point I want to make about yeah, sorry, one point I want to make about sort of valuation. I think is the key point. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, first-time entrepreneurs at least, get very hung up about you know kind of valuations. I think the point I would like to make is first of all, 100% of zero is zero. So think about growing the pie, not how, how much stake you own in, in the initial thing. And the second thing is you want the investors to work for you and the investors will only work for you if they think they've gotten a good deal right so don't basically push it too hard because if you really push it they might invest and they think they've got a crap deal mm -hmm. they will spend their time elsewhere with other companies mm -hmm. to maximize their because they have a portfolio of companies so you want them to work for yours in that portfolio mm -hmm. so make sure they they also get a good deal
So don't try to maximize your potential in your seed round. Yeah. It's yeah. not a good idea. Yeah, we had the long term. We had the <laughs> yeah, we had the one of the talks the during Enterprise Tech Star, we had a, a VC talking to us and he said basically they are looking into ten percent of all the applications they receive um, and they decide to like to fund only one percent. So it is it's quite tough and tight uh, yeah. uh, you have to put that in mind. Mm. So anyone has more questions? Here. Uh, hi, I'm Shweta. I'm doing my MBA at the Judge Business School. Uh, thank you all of you for such great insights. Uh, what do you think is uh, the right thing for the entrepreneurship uh, going uh, for anybody in the room? Is it right people, right place, right product, right time, or right luck? You can't just have one. You need some more. I think right people has to be the start. And I think, what do you mean by right people? I think is the people that you can trust uh, and uh, trust in the most deepest way. And I think, uh, again, I've been, and the fact that I found people I can trust is because of luck, big part, right? So to the point that when we started the company, uh, Dongo and I had to create, like, like in the early days, there's two of us, and we had to kind of create a slide set to go, out, go for investor meeting. And I asked Dongo, I said, Dongo, do you want to be the CEO? He said, no. So there was no option, right? So I had to be. And I think so that's the level of trust we've had from day one. And I think that also exemplifies how we make decisions in the company. So anything that's not machine learning, I deal with on, on the business side, because that's like the trust. And any decision to do, do with machine learning or engineering who to hire, it's his decision, it's not my decision. Because and you know, that partly reflects the success of the company. It just shows I didn't make those decisions. But if I had made, you know, we wouldn't have done any of the good stuff that we did on the technical side here. Yeah. Are you asking what's the most important thing? <laughs> I'm not really sure it kind of could be a list in order, actually. <laughs> but they are quite intertwined, like Vishal just said. Um, people is important, but I don't think if you don't have... I mean, I, I think... Um, um, my partner uh, works on this business. I think it depends a lot on the people. You've obviously got a good relationship with your partner, but I wouldn't be afraid to go it alone if you don't have those kind of relationships. Some people are really good loan CEOs or directors or entrepreneurs, and other people are better in partnerships. So kind of don't, don't think you have to have a partner. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, again, uh, Mirawat uh, Shweta said thank you very much. Very insightful, everything uh, that you guys have, have spoken about. Um, if I may, two questions. Um, so first one is for Dr. Cassidy. Um, Vishal mentioned the, the value of death, and you immediately replied saying I'm having a lot of trouble with that. Uh, if possible, uh, again, I'm sure that there's a lot of things that you, you can't speak about publicly. would love to just hear what are the things that you're struggling with, what's the journey that you have at the moment, and really the barriers that you're facing. Uh, and then the other question is uh, for Louise. Uh, so I read, and you also mentioned that you recently exited your yoga business. Uh, did you have any um, fear in handing that business over to uh, the people that took it over? I don't know whether you're still involved or whether it's been a you know complete handover, but you know it's obviously something that you grew yourself and that you have a lot of passion in and pride in. Uh, was there a lot of anxiety from your side in in handing that over to someone else? Thank Absolutely you. none. <laughs> no, none at all. Sorry, I'm. That was the second Bingo question, questions. but a simple answer, really. So, no, none at all. Everything has its time. You know, this was a nine-year-old business, and I don't know, I mean, what kind of mentality you are. Actually, this touched on a point earlier as well, that there's a startup mentality, and this is my mentality. I am the startup mentality, and, and I love that. Um, but the people I've sold the business to, they're the people who can make it really big. I'm not that person. You know, really, actually, I should have knocked a couple of years off and done it a couple of years ago, and, and they could, would have grown it much bigger, much faster. Um, and, I mean, I was running two businesses in parallel, and that is, that, I don't know if any of you do that, but that was challenging, having that split focus, mm -hmm. having to still keep sort of breathing life into both of them. So, yes, in short, no, absolutely no anxiety. I was absolutely delighted to hand it over to someone else who, could, who can make it much bigger. Um, and to answer the first question, I think what, what I was kind of getting at was that there are set metrics, not necessarily set numbers, but set metrics that investors understand. So in, especially in tech, you know, users, ARR, retention, things like that, um, which don't really fit very well with deep tech. And then some deep tech does have good metrics. So drug companies, 
a bit easier because you've got a few things that you can tick off. You know, does it? I don't know. I don't know what they are. Like, kill a mouse or whatever, which is bad. Um, so there, those kind of things have good metrics. Pure tech plays have good metrics because they're apps that go out. You know, dating apps or whatever. But if you're trying to do weird hybrid things in the middle that are either really heavy on maths and ML or really heavy in kind of collecting genomic data and doing a bit of ML, then the metrics that you show are really tricky. Because if I say to um, your average investor, or oh, we have 20,000 genomes, they're like, I don't care, what, what is that? What's a genome? You know, which is a real difficult, it's a difficult thing to kind of frame in their heads of we believe each thing is worth this much money in the future and we have this many of those things, therefore it's good. You know, it's, it's a difficult, you have, to, you have to, I guess, decide whether you, or you have to frame your messaging so you can do a story-based raise rather than a metrics-based raise, or a story-based raise with some support from metrics, which is a tricky thing to work out. So that's what I was getting. More questions? Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk. My name is Alex. I'm a master's student here. Um, just a quick question to what John said, but also just in general. So for first-time entrepreneurs, um, when I first founded my business, I think I was obsessed with the thought of changing the world. It almost blinded me from actual opportunities where I was like, wow, I listened to a market and I actually saw someone say something about a certain thing which I never thought about. So I changed my idea. I did that first. And then essentially from that, I could invest or get involved in things which change the world. So do you think that people should also listen more to what the market says instead of just obsessing about changing something radically in a market to then later on get involved in changing the world? Because that would be really interesting. Um, <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, so, so you mean? So you mean, should you just decide that everybody needs a certain product and go out there and just follow that 100% or should you research the market a bit first? So I think what I, meant, what I meant more was that often you have opportunities where you can provide instant value, right? And they okay. often provide cash flow heavy businesses where you don't need to get investment or something, but just something similar. So in my case, for example, it was a translation agency in the blockchain space instead uh -huh. of building a blockchain project. Uh -huh. Because through that, I then got exposure to different projects. So do you think that for first time founders, maybe it might be best to like have an experience first and provide instant value and then have the chance later to get involved in more high level things? So the absolute best thing that you can do is create something which is fairly simple and gives a lot of money. And then you've got a lot of time that you can go and do other things that are transformative. <laughs> so that's, so that's what Google does, right? That's what they did. So that's the best thing you can do, in my opinion. I guess you got to find out a hybrid. So I think it's difficult to follow follow a dream that's never going to get tested by the market until I don't know Series E or whatever. That's a difficult thing to do. But then it is also like there's a there's a line if you like between being a startup and being a consultant. And it is at some point if you just only focus on short term gain, you will just end up as a genomics consultant. Which could be fine if you want that. That's fine, but um, but I think you've got to figure out where you want to be on that on that line. So those are like almost defining what entrepreneurship is, essentially. Like for for your like for yourself, like thinking of what is actually entrepreneurship to me. What does it actually entail? How do I define you, it? You just got to work out like what you want to. What are you trying to do in like you know ten years? Like a, if you want to run a dive shop in Valley, then that's great. But you don't have to do that on the blockchain, you know. So I think it's about, it's about figuring out, knowing yourself, I guess, and figuring out what you, what you want to do. And if you, if you will only ever believe in blockchain translation services and that's, you truly think that that's going to change the world, then yeah, just go for it. And, and I guess it's in that notion about changing the world is also probably people have you know, different ideas of it. So perhaps have a simpler view on it that the fact that you've had a positive influence on anybody's life, you have changed the world because yeah, essentially you've had one step in basically unlocking it. And so the fact that you had your very uh, successful business, obviously you're changing the way people operate and you're changing gradually as as things move forward. So it's, uh, 
and to have a positive, changeable impact on the world. You don't have to be an entrepreneur. You can do it in any number of ways, like you know, Nelson Mandela or Gandhi or whatever. So I think there's there's view to that, and uh, so yeah, you're changing the world every day with your actions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you please talk more about this is the idea that I see and this is my execution plan for that. What were the top three things you did when you decided to pursue that idea? Thank you. I didn't quite hear the question. Sorry, if you sorry. repeat the question. Yeah. Can, you, can you repeat? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Uh, can you please talk more about how you transition from idea to execution, that this is the opportunity that I see and this is my execution plan and what were the top three things you did for to take benefit of that opportunity? Um, we validated some stuff and some publicly available data and then we went to a cancer clinic and we said, do you like this thing in theory if it worked? And they were like, yeah, we'll invest. And then it kind of snowballed from there. So that's only two. Pick co founders as well. And how much did you fundraise? Uh, we've done about six or seven million. So I think for us it was, I think from the, we had the idea. The idea was, but as you can probably realize, it's, it's a pretty straightforward idea. You help people optimize certain decisions, but the whole, Maths was very complicated, and the entire sort of engineering challenge was so kind of massive. Uh, and to me, it was clear that my engineering and architecture skills were nowhere near enough to even think about the execution challenge. So from the execution point of view, uh, the first decision I made was to hire the best uh, person I knew to build an engineering team, and who's our VP of engineering. Uh, and essentially, everything that I couldn't do to make this company successful, I started hiring people for that. So that was a re-execution plan, put it very simply. So everybody in the company who does their job can do it way better than I can do. So that was the execution plan. <laughs> Hi. Um, so earlier you spoke about how you know 95% of the investors shouldn't agree with you. But where do you draw that line between, okay, your idea is crazy and it might work, and it's crazy and it's not going to work at all? How do you figure that out? So I think, again, you know, different people have worked it on different things. And because of my sort of a technical background or my engineering background, for me, the fundamental thing is that the science has to be right. <coughs> if the science is right, you can build a business. But if the science is wrong, it's not. So I think for us, we had enough understanding as a, as a team that the maths that we were trying to do had the right foundations. Uh, uh, Carl Rasmussen, who was, uh, who, who was our chief scientist, had written a book about it uh, at that time, sort of 10 years before, or, or, or nine years before we started the company. And so he said the mathematical foundations are there. It's very hard to engineer. Uh, this is how the world should think about these problems. They are not. And hence, sort of that gave us like the confidence. So I trusted uh, Carl and Dong Ho to have the scientific insight because I trusted their uh, sort of a judgment on this, hundred uh, percent. And that gave me the confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Robert. Or. Um uh, nickname Firebreath, so I very much enjoyed you um, talking about breathing that passion earlier as an entrepreneur. Um, so my startup is physical gaming, creating the world's most intuitive board games. And I very much come from a side where it's like, oh, traditional entrepreneurship um, it was really all about building the company and building the culture that you wanted. But now all we hear about is, is this fast growing, and it's all about investment. You hardly hear about, oh, you know, we build this company with our own money or with our own, um, putting in more time. So I want to ask you, as sitting on the panel with having that experience, is where does that fit in in the modern world, and why don't we hear about that anymore, especially at the business school? What, the talk about passion? No, and the talk about um, building your company without outside investment. <coughs> okay. I think the vast majority of companies are still funded by 
kind of friends, family, and outside um, insiders. Um, <clears throat> I always say to people when they say, because I think a lot of people don't get started because they don't have any money. I mean, I don't come from a background of money, but I never let that stop me. So I think, you know, let that be the, perhaps the last thing on your list. Because um, from my experience, and this may sound completely bonkers, but the idea was sound, the framework was constructed, and then suddenly the money appeared. It was kind of like that. And I think probably if you deconstructed these mm. guys, they would say a similar thing. Um, so just go for it. <laughs> you know, put the passion and the energy into it. Um, I thought about what you just said just now about this tangible. If you've got something tangible, this is good. What we do is quite tangible. You can come to the restaurant, you can taste the food, you can see the pictures, you can read the reviews. All of this stuff really helps to draw people towards you. Um, and the more they believe in your product, the more they will invest in it. Mm. I think with, um, you know, it's a little bit different with drug discovery, I guess, because there are very set ways of doing things. Um, but if you, but again, it's the same thing if you have the data to show that your idea isn't completely crazy and, and you can show why, how what you're doing is different from other people, then I think the, the investment will come to you. Yeah. I think it's perfectly okay to start a business without raising venture capital. And it's a great way to start a business. You can completely bootstrap, so you don't have to worry about a lot of other stuff. right? But I think it's just the kind of businesses that we sort of represent, like a lot of our, 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 our deep tech. So our company till date has raised kind of $50 million uh, to, to where we are. Uh, I didn't have $50 million. <laughs> <laughs> next time, next startup. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this question's for Louise. You've gone down the equity crowdfunding route I just wanted your perspective on how you managed to get others to, I guess, spot the opportunity with you. Yeah, okay, so that's, um, I was, was going to disclose the crowdfunding, but now you've brought it up. <laughs> we can talk about it, because obviously I'm completely different from this, kind of, although having said that, we're now facing Series A funding and talking to venture capitalists, so it's come. Um, you know, crowdfunding is very interesting. Are you considering it? I invested in your first round. Oh, right. Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, I suppose you could probably answer your own question then, can you? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, something like, there's two things with what I do, the vegan thing, uh, the, the vegan thing for vegans and the plant-based space is a, a really interesting space to invest in right now. So you've got those two types of people. Uh, the vegans are obviously easy to enthuse because they, they just want, if they want to invest some money in, in it, they'll put it into a vegan business. Um, and, you know, it was just right place, right time. It was the excitement of it. It was the product itself. Um, I don't know. It just took off, like, really fast. Um, the, the, the equity one, which we did, it to, uh, we're just about to do another one next year, 2018, March. I mean, you, you know, a lot of it, again, you know, the stuff's in the background. You don't necessarily see it. Um, there was a lot of work going on building that, building, building, building. I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse, for example, than going live on a crowdfunding platform that only 20% funded. <laughs> Because people do, and, and they're just flatline, you know. So for me, I, we got to 80% funded before we went live on Crowdcube. Um, I, I mean, I was very, very mildly disappointed because I actually wanted to be 100% funded by the time we went live, because it's all about overfunding. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into that in the background so that when you go, you, you, you know, there's that great excitement wave that goes with it. And I suppose there's a probably a version of it here as well. It's about building it up, building it up to the right point. And again, come back to the risk we mentioned earlier. So you're sort of de-risking it for yourself, really, mm -hmm. by putting in the work in advance. So does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One of our investors is um, uh, Tom Bloomfield, who founded Monzo. And he says the same thing about crowdfunding. The, I looked at Monzo. They are they were the one that I looked at. Yeah. Their, their they page like they had of like you know their, their their messaging was this is going to go really fast. You yeah. better get yourself yeah. pre-registered now because it's going to go that wild fast. And it's all about yeah. creating that kind Hats of off to them. excitement really and then also kind of buzz around a thing happening and then creating not just investors but creating people who are going to go out there and shove a pink card in their friend's face and be like get this get this yeah. get this because they're kind of part of that journey part of that um, community I guess. But again, disruptors, you see, these are the people who are just doing it differently now. So, so yeah, look outside of what you do here, what these people are doing. Because, I mean, I literally read one page of what Monzo had done, and from that came my whole crowdfunding campaign, because suddenly I realised it was possible. And what you, what you said earlier about the big, big, uh, big slice small pie, or small slice big pie, 
very kind of common mindset in crowdfunding mindset now. You know, open it all out. Yep. Let lots of people jump on board with it. I think it was everyone says that investors will invest in people, and I think you know yep. if you've got. If you're very passionate, that will come across and people will be drawn to that. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Israel. I'm studying the MBA here. And I would like to know the perspective in particular um, from Louise and Vishal, uh, but the others are uh, also welcome to, to join the discussion. <laughs> Uh, but uh, with regards to the novelty aspect, the way the investors saw the novelty aspect of your businesses, and uh, how did they, um, how was their response in terms of, okay, it, is it very novel and we need to educate the, the entire market? Or, uh, I mean, is it uh, easy to go to the market but not very novel? something that I would expect to grow a lot. So I think is the, is the question that do the investors favor something that is less novel and has already a market versus how did they react to a high level of novelty which was completely unknown on how it would be accepted by the market? Yeah, I mean, in your experiences, because I, I am certain that you, you got a very different uh, experience in, in terms of this aspect in special. Yeah, so I guess it also comes from a bit of a thinking and what sort of you know, you know sort of uh, sort of excites you, and I'm just kind of the person who can't do anything twice. Uh, I just is is just you know for me it's as I said I get bored, you know. So post vocal IQ as an example, every investor I met said that oh you guys know a lot about what you know kind of voice systems. Why don't you do another you know voice company? I said hell no. You know, <laughs> like kind of done that. I can't wake up in the morning and think about the same thing again. Uh, so for me personally, uh, that sort of a novelty thing was important. Otherwise, I wouldn't. Uh, if I'm not doing anything novel, I'm happy to get a job in any other. You know, you know, sort of a company, I just can't do the same thing twice or something that's already been done because there is no thing that sort of tickles my brain on doing something new or that adds more value, right? But you, of course, have a lot of businesses that do that. It's just my personal. To convince the investors obviously makes it orders of magnitude harder because now you're talking about an approach that has no prior art. You're talking about building out a platform that nobody's done before. You're talking about a system architecture which has never been developed. So there was no prior art at all of anything that you wanted to do. We're talking about <coughs> business model, there was no business model. right? How do you evaluate a decision? Or how do you sell a decision to a company? You can sell software, right? Uh, but then slowly learn how to do that where the entire notion has changed instead of throwing the software on the other side of the wall to your customer and letting them unlock the value we as a company took responsibility for unlocking the value. But then some investors came to us, but you are a, a, a consulting company because in the investor circle, like the C word is like really bad, right? So how do you explain to the investors, we are not a consulting company, we are a consultative sales company. So it was, a, it, it, it was very hard, it was very sort of iterative. Uh, and lots of doors slammed on the faces, as I said, you know, 95%. But that's where the element of being deeply stubborn sort of comes in when the more no's you hear, the stronger your uh, resolve becomes. And I think that was really the thing that we had to do. Were, were they afraid that the market wasn't there? I mean, uh, such a new thing. I guess I wasn't afraid the market wasn't there because it was obvious to me because, had, because I started my career in manufacturing and operations. And for me, the market was such as with the first customer. Is somebody sends trucks to pick up an asset, like a kind of pallets in this case. Uh, there are 300 million pallets they have. They don't really know where they are exactly. And they're sort of guessing. And if you can come up with a way uh, without data, generate synthetic data, and make the pallet picking up process uh, more effective, so you can reduce the failed collections, and then you can calculate how many tens of millions of savings you have. So yes, so you can do that. But the question is, you have no software to do that. It'll take you two, three years to build out the software to, be, to make it happen. 
but the market is there. And uh, whether you pick up pallets, uh, beer kegs, uh, containers, there's lots of stuff to be picked up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that we're running uh, out of time. So, Louis, the question oh, was also for oh, Louis. I think he. Uh, I think you can, you can give a quick answer. <laughs> I, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're um, particularly normal. I think with us, it was a case of um, people had been waiting for somebody to come along and claim the space that we were operating in in a much more serious way than had been done previously. So I think when we did that, people had been waiting for it anyway. So that was one one reason that they all came on board. Thank you. So, uh, how about everyone gives like a brief 30 seconds of, uh, <laughs> of what their advice is on spotting opportunity and what is the take home message? Start with you, John. Well, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess uh, I would say uh, go into. Go into life in general consciously so decide what you how you measure success what is success for you and then think about how you get there and if that is starting a startup company then pick the right co-founder and pick an idea or a problem or whatever that is going to excite you in five years time um, and then just go and do it I would say uh, to, yeah, you just need to be very driven, focused and determined and, and um, like somebody was saying, it, the more people who tell you it's not going to happen, that, that should spur you on yeah. to, to work hard and make it happen. Um, just do the thing that you love the most, you know. Do the, do the thing that that's what you live for. That's why you get up in the morning. That's the thing you think about most. Um, with me, it's like an itch as well. It's like a kind of compulsion to kind of progress. So go for those things, you know. Don't, don't sidetrack yourself and just appraise the market. I think that would be a mistake. Yeah, you can get paralyzed by indecision, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this kind of idea of too much market research, finding yeah. the thing that no one else is doing. My first business wasn't something that no one else was doing. I just went and did it differently. So, yeah, and again, people will tell you that. They'll tell you, don't do that because X, Y, Z. But don't let that be your reason not to. I, I absolutely agree with, with, with uh, what uh, the three other uh, panelists have said. So I would probably give advice more on uh, managing the mental state as an entrepreneur. Uh, you will have lots of days when things don't go very well. So how do you manage that? So I think I would strongly encourage to have a very strong hobby, ideally a sport, because crap will happen and a lot of shit will go wrong. But in those days, at least something else is going right, right? So there were days when there was no funding, there was days, but because I like to run, so I used to come back from a run. At least something went right, you know, at least something in your life. So I think that's very important. Whatever it takes you, 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 you need to really maintain that. And the second aspect I learned uh, in, 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 in my early working days was how to go to bed and sleep uh, while still having lots of things that needed to be done. So. Uh, my mentor at that particular time used to give me this analogy of taking like a mental matchbox and everything that you had and you were worrying about, put it one at a time in a matchbox, close the matchbox, read a good book and sleep and, and, and try and go to sleep. So two most important things. And I think if you worry about things and you can't sleep, build the skill to sleep before you become an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you'll have lots of sleepless nights, and it's not good for your health. If you are uh, an aspiring <laughs> entrepreneur, uh, there are lots of opportunities at Cambridge that you can uh, either uh, test out your idea, find an idea, or just uh, explore the ecosystem. Um, for PhDs and postdocs, there are the Enterprise Tech PhD Plus program where you can participate and uh, uh, join a group where there is an inventor 
um, that you can uh, look at commercialization. There is also Enterprise Tech Star, which is for people who are thinking about funding a com uh, founding a company. Um, besides that, there is Enterprise Tuesday, which is a flagship program at the Entrepreneurship Center. Enterprise Women for um, uh, women who want to <laughs> be founders and lecture series. Um, so. I would say if you want to pursue something, don't wait and don't ponder and think too much. Just go try it out. And thank you so much for uh, coming to Enterprise Tuesdays and thank you to the panel and my co-chair Mo for a great discussion. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, I think you've done the, the closing introductions. Um, from myself representing the Entrepreneurship Centre, my name is Rebecca Myers. I'm the Head of Education, also the Director of Enterprise Tech, Enterprise Tech Star, various other things. Um, it's really great to see so many people here today. Jen and Mo, you've done a fantastic job. I've been watching you guys on the live stream running around behind. Um, thank you very much for coming along this evening. We have a networking reception out in the Simon Sainsbury's building, if you would all like to join us there, and hopefully our speakers will stay around too. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Well done. Yeah? You got the job. <laughs> thank you.